You're really going to enjoy this message. Here we're going to talk about how much is enough. Not for me, for you. How much money do you really want? We're going to be introduced to a very special friend of mine, a great speaker and quite a result-oriented guy, Paul Hutsey from Pittsburgh, Kansas. And we're going to be talking about the image maker. You are an image maker. Now, on page 17, at the top of the page, how much is enough? Earl Nightingale said something that I love. He said, most people think they want more money than they really do, and they settle for a lot less than they could get. I think probably many of you were born with the very same idea I was, or raised with it anyway, that if you're going to earn any money, you're going to have to work really hard. Well, let me go back to what Napoleon Hill said here. He said, one idea is all that you need to achieve the success you seek. Now, he said, when riches begin to come, they're going to come so quickly and in such great abundance that one wonders where they've been hiding through all those lean years. Now, he said, this is an astounding statement, and all the more so when you take into consideration the popular belief that riches come only to those who work hard and long. When you begin to think and grow rich, you're going to observe that riches begin with a state of mind, with definiteness of purpose, with little or no hard work. He said, you and every person ought to be interested in knowing how to acquire that state of mind which will attract riches. Now, in another part, way towards the middle of the book, he reemphasizes this. He said, if you are one of those people who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, perish the thought because it's not true. He said, riches, when they come in huge quantities, are never the result of hard work. Riches come, if they come at all, in response to definite demands based upon the application of definite principles and not by chance or lack. Now, we're talking about the definite principles. It's up to you to apply them. You want to stop and think, how can I fill a definite demand? Now, you don't have to go too far to see very poor service. These people have never gained an understanding of the law of compensation. The law of compensation is based on three very simple points. The amount of money you and I earn is always going to be in direct ratio to the need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty will, there will be in replacing us. Now, there very likely is a great need for what you do. You had nothing to do with that. That need was just there. Your ability to fill that need. All you have to do every day is put forth an effort to do whatever you're doing better. And as you do that, you're going to find that it'll become very difficult to replace you. There's very few pros around. A lot of people busy, but not too many doing it properly. Now, we're saying for you to get into this prosperity concept or get it into high gear, you must be specific. If you want some money, you have to be certain that you know exactly how much money you want. You see, what we're working with is our subconscious mind. Now, we've touched on that a few times. Let's take a look at it again. It's the ideas that have been programmed into our subconscious mind through repetition that is forming the conditioning that is there now. It's that conditioning that causes us to do what we do and get the results we get. If there's poverty in this area or a lack of wealth, the problem is not in what we do. The problem is in what causes us to do it. You see, the action or the behavior is an effect. Now, this is what everyone works at changing. They're working at changing effects. If you want to change a result, it's absolutely essential that you go to the cause of the problem, the primary cause. 
And the cause of your financial situation right now is right in here in the subconscious mind. Now, what we must do is consciously choose, think, and build an idea of the prosperity that we're looking for here in our consciousness. Then we have to get emotionally involved in that idea. Now, people without money would have a difficult time accepting this. I have never met anyone with money that had a difficult time accepting this. As a matter of fact, they know it, and that's why they have the money. Now, you're working with your subconscious mind, and you have to know exactly how much you want. Now, let's stop and think for a few minutes about money. We live in one of the richest countries in the history of the world. There's absolutely no question about that. You can work productively all of your life, let's say for 40, 45 years. And you know it's a strange thing, but only one or two people out of a hundred at the end of their commercial career are financially independent. And yet anyone can become financially independent. And the strange thing about it is you never have to earn a lot of money to become financially independent. Very, very few people earn a lot of money. There is point four, five, three percent of the population that are earning a hundred thousand dollars a year or more. Less than one half of one percent earn a hundred thousand dollars a year or more. Now, that's shocking to the average person's mind. Quite often in seminars, we'll ask different individuals, how many people do you think? What percentage of the population? I had a young lady the other day in a seminar down in Ottawa say about a third. Less than one half of one percent. If you go back and take a look at the number of people that are earning between 50 and 100,000, you're going to find it's a ridiculously low number. There's only 4.5% earning in excess of $50,000 a year. The number that go between 25 and 50 is 53%. So when you're at those cocktail parties or the neighborhood barbecue, don't believe all the stories you're hearing because they ain't necessarily so. Now let's think of this. Do we have anybody here that's 20 years old? 21? Andy, let me ask you a question. Do you want, do you want to stand up for a moment? Andy, how many ways... Let me shake your hand first. How you doing, Andy? Good. I'm doing wonderful. Andy, how many ways do you think there are to earn money? Hundreds. Well, you know, it's written in the book that there's only two. Just two ways. Now, that's a little shocking to most people. I had a young man the other day say one way. He was really close. <laughs> there's two ways. One is people at work, and the other is money at work. They're the only two ways that you have to earn money. Do you work, Andy? Yes, I do. You do. Do you blow, spend one of those each week? Very easily. Very easily. What we're looking at here is a $20 bill. Andy, when you got up this morning, did you sit on the side of the bed and think, I wonder if I'll get dressed today? No, I didn't. Just automatically got dressed, didn't yes, you? I did. That's a habit. All right? That's something we do without giving any conscious thought to it. Andy, let's suppose you took one of these $20 bills and set it aside each week. Just fold it up and set it aside. And you did that for 50 weeks. You have 50 20s. 
How much money would you have? A thousand bucks. A thousand bucks. Now, Andy, if you did that for 50 weeks, you'd have probably formed a habit of doing it. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. <laughs> Habits are hard to break, aren't they? Yes, they are. Andy, if you kept doing it every year for 40 years, how much would you have? $40,000. $40,000. That's right. That's if you just left it sitting there. However, if you found someone that really understood how to find gainful employment for that $20 bill, and you give it to them to put to work for you, then you've got two ways going for you. You're working, Andy, and so is your 20. Do you know at the end of 40 years, you wouldn't have 40,000, Andy. Do you know how much you'd have? What do you think you might have? So a couple hundred thousand dollars? A couple hundred thousand. If they only found gainful employment at 10%, you'd have $450,000. Yet all you've ever done is set aside $20 a week. If they found gainful employment for it at 12%, Andy, you wouldn't have 450000 you'd have 850000 And if they found gainful employment for this $20 bill at 14%, and there's many people around that can help you do that today, you'd have $1,520,000, Andy. And all you've ever done is set aside $20 a week. And you'd have a million and a half dollars working for you. Now, there's less than one half of one percent of the population of your country that are earning in excess of a hundred thousand. If you never spent the hundred and fifty or the million five, if you just left it sitting there, Andy, do you know that it would earn for you between a hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand dollars a year? And you'd still have your million and a half. I would imagine you could probably get by on that for a while, couldn't you? <laughs> if I had to. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. And all Andy's ever done is set aside $20 a week. Do you know if Andy worked on chips at McDonald's and never got promoted, he could become a millionaire? So do you see, the classical error that most people make is if you want to be a millionaire, you have to earn a lot of money. And, of course, that's not true. If you want to be a millionaire, you have to have a plan to be a millionaire. That's all you need. You just have to make up your mind you're going to become. How many of you would like to be millionaires? Be honest. Let me see a show of hands. Everybody's hands up. How about you? Would you like to be a millionaire? You know, you can. All you have to do is set aside one of those each week. Give it to someone who really understands money. Now, I would be the wrong guy to give it to. If you have any doubt about this, you just ask my wife. <laughs> you see, John was mentioning his goal was to earn more money than his wife could spend. I set that goal quite a while ago, and my wife said she was up to the challenge. <laughs> Why aren't there more people become millionaires? Do you think it's possibly because they're not in the habit of setting one of those aside? What would you say a habit was? We said a habit was an idea that was fixed here in our subconscious mind with respect to money. Now, if there's such a small number of people make it, they, they must have a habit in their subconscious mind with respect to money, but I would say it's a bad habit. But you know, through conscious choice, we can form a good habit. We can renew the mind. And you only have to discipline yourself for a very, very short period of time. Now, do you know there's many people that'll tell you they can't save any money because they're in debt? Well, if you want to use that as an excuse, go ahead. But in my books, it's a poor one. You can be in debt and still put money to work for you. As a matter of fact, if there's only two ways of earning money, it would be an excellent idea to get both ways working, especially if you're in debt. Now, take a look at page 18. If you find the task of getting your financial world in good order for this exciting journey is something 
that you're just not able to do, I would strongly suggest that you seek professional assistance. Now, this is something that all wealthy people do. Now, let's go back and take a look here again. John, in the last lesson, encouraged you to be very honest, take stock where you're at. I'm suggesting you decide exactly where you want to go or the star that you want to hit. Now, all we need to get from here to here is a plan and then follow it. You don't have to know exactly everything you have to do, but you have to go to someone who does. I mentioned earlier that many years ago, I earned in excess of a million dollars in one year. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I'm not too proud of, but it's the truth. At the end of the year, I didn't have any money. I was one of those rich people that didn't have any money. I was living fairly well, but nothing extraordinary. I didn't buy any planes or trains. Or I didn't shoot off to Paris for a weekend. I wasn't in the habit of flying off to Atlantic City or Las Vegas and play on the tables. And matter of fact, I didn't even know where it went. There were some things I wanted that I wasn't even able to afford to buy, and they weren't extraordinary things. Now, if you've always worked for a, let's say, an average wage, you might be wondering, well, how did he do it? It wasn't difficult. There's some people here in the audience that have done exactly the same thing, probably a number of you. And you'll just say, no, it wasn't difficult. Do you know that most people have never sat down with someone that really understands money? I think if you... Uh, needed an operation, you had to have your appendix removed or something, I don't think you'd talk to the guy next door unless the guy next door happened to be a very competent surgeon. I think if you needed a root canal, it'd be highly unlikely you'd talk to your druggist about it. I have mentioned earlier here on the uh, tape that we had a bit of a catastrophe with our plumbing this morning. I. Uh, I didn't phone the electrician to have that repaired. Why is it we just ask anyone for advice? Why is it we just say, what do you think? The person we're asking probably doesn't. <laughs> but they'll always give you an opinion. Well, we're suggesting you sit down with someone that really understands. Now, wealthy people follow the advice of financial experts. It is similar to the principle of the idea that if a person's body were sick, he or she would seek out a skilled physician for advice. Moreover, you should also keep in mind that even healthy people, if they're wise, periodically go to a doctor for a checkup. You know, I went to a doctor for a checkup here just recently. There was nothing wrong with me. And my wife says, go, so I went, you know. I do everything she tells me. And... Uh, <laughs> He was examining me, and I thought, wonder why he wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> I thought, I'd hate to do this. You see, I'm a salesperson, and I love to sell. I actually pity a person that's not. Now, I know there's a lot of people that love what they do, and they probably pity the salesperson, but that's the way I think. And so, of course, I was comparing what he did with selling. Now, I thought I'd much rather sell. But I still went for his advice, even though there was nothing wrong with me. Now, I want you to think about this. You don't have to be sick to get better. Come down to the middle of page 18. We say it's already been brought to your attention that very few people ever develop real expertise in the area of serious financial planning. They just don't do it. Therefore, we should seek out the, a, a competent financial counselor. Now, if you are not on the road to financial independence, this is probably why. There's three categories that people generally fall into. Number one, they're in a deficit position. That means there's more going out than there is coming in. They're in debt. Number two, 
they're in a break-even position. Everything that comes in goes back out. Number three, they're in a surplus position. They have more coming in than what is going out. Now, you know, you could be in any one of those three positions, and it might still be wise to sit down with someone who really understands money. You know, that takes some studying. As a matter of fact, it takes a lot of studying. It's a full-time job. It's not something you're going to do on a part-time basis. You've got to be as sharp as a tack, and I'm going to suggest that you have to have the left hemisphere of your brain fairly highly developed because it's quite a technical task. And, of course, I operate from the right hemisphere of my brain. Someone wants to... me I was a bi-hemispherical paraplegic, and I'm inclined to agree with them. I just operate from about half of my brain. That's the conceptual side. The other side is kind of useless. Now, a person that's in a deficit position could form the, the opinion, and it would be tragic, that all they have to do is get more money coming in, and that would solve their problem. However, if they're in the habit, if they've got a habit, now think of this of spending more than they earn, would bringing in more solve their problem? No. No. Of course not. If a person was in a break-even position, if they were in the habit of spending everything they earned, would bringing in more money solve their problem? No. No. Well, Maybe the person should change a habit. Maybe the person should change the way they think. Maybe they should change the source of their advice. How many of you would really like to become financially independent? Be honest. Ask yourself, do you really want to change your financial position? Now, I'm going to give you a formula that the masses use, and because they use it, they end up broke. It's a simple formula. There's nothing complicated about it. They take their income, they subtract from their income their expenses, and what is left, they save. What do you think the problem is? I beg your pardon? Nothing, nothing left. No. It costs them more to live than what they're earning. Now, here's a formula for financial freedom. I like that better than financial independence because I'm going to tell you money will generate a respectable amount of freedom. How many of you would like to go to Paris that have never been there? How many would like to go to Rio that has never been there? How many would like to go to Madrid and never been there? All you need is a few bucks. A person should sit down and establish financial goals. They should know exactly what they want to be worth a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now. Without giving any thought of how they're going to get there, this is where I want to be. Then they should add to that their expenses. Do you know that most people do not even have the brain cells to figure that out properly? I might be able to, but it would probably take me a long time, and I would really be afraid that I would make a big error. This is something that has to be done by a pro. Most people are not able to even identify all the areas they spend money. Well, they may think they do, but they really don't. When they add those two together, that tells them what their income must be. Now, that doesn't change their income, but at least they've got a target to shoot at. Now, if you want to become financially independent, sit down and decide exactly what you want. Go to a real good financial counselor, a financial planner, and let them get involved in what they call a fact-finding mission. 
They've got farms. They've got that little chip now. I mean, there's so many ways that they can do it. Let them figure out what it costs you to live. And then you're going to know how much you have to earn. Now, here's how we change it. I want you to take the back of that little card that you've got. Take the back of that little buff card. Draw a box on it like that. Now, if you're sitting in your den, in your family room, maybe out in the backyard, go and get a pad and a paper. Just turn this off until you get it, and then put that box on. Now, take and draw a line right down the center. Now, take and put four lines inside the box. Now, above the first set of boxes, write an M. Above the last one, put an F. Put a T beside the M and a T beside the F. Put a W in the center. Now, we've created a week's calendar. I like to do it a little different. Now, what we're going to do now is take and change it into mornings and afternoons. A.M. Let's loosen this up a bit. You repeat this after me as you write it in. Come on. A.M. A.M. Ah, oh, come on. Only about a half year doing it. Right? What did John say? The more you put in, the more you get out. Come on. A.M. 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 <laughs> No, you see, I started ahead of you, so I, I'm usually a millisecond ahead of the mass. All right. Now, let's take the other boxes and put in PM. Come on. PM, 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 PM. There, we all finished the same time. You learn quick. All right. Now, let's stop and look at what the average person does. They go out and they work Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, Friday morning, Friday afternoon, and they earn, let's say, $35,000 a year, and they give it all to someone else. Every cent of it. They give it to the mortgage company, they give it to the grocery store company, they give it to the leasing company, they give it to the gas station company, they give it to the dry cleaning company. They give it all away. It was their money. They worked for it. They earned it. And they didn't even keep any of it. Do you know the ancient Babylonians go way, way back? They knew exactly how to become financially independent. They were a very, very, very wealthy race of people. They said that a part of all you earn is yours to keep. And what you should do is take the first part you earn. That's yours. Now, you're going to find people say, but I couldn't afford to do that. Oh, the truth is, you can't afford not to do that. Because, you see, the latter years of your life, what should actually be the worst may very well turn, or the best, should, may very well turn out to be the worst. Andy, a million and a half. And all you've ever done is set aside $20 a week. Is that correct? Have you any idea, Andy, what you would be worth in a relatively short period of time if you did that? If you just said, I'm going to take what I earn between 8 a.m. and noon on Monday, and I am going to pay me that. Anyone that is prepared to make that kind of a commitment, I can assure you, can become financially independent in a relatively short period of time. Now, for many years, I traveled with John all over the place, all over the country. We would work up 200 cities in a year. And we were working with all kinds of financial institutions. And you know what really puzzled me? These people were working around money all the time, but they didn't understand it. Most of them didn't even have very much of it. It's like Bernard Brook one time said. He said it puzzled him. 
people on Wall Street worked around money all their life, and yet they didn't understand it. They thought they were excited because they were earning money. The truth is they were earning the money because they got excited. There's a story of Pat and John in the Born Rich book. Pat and John are friends of mine. Here about six years ago, five years ago, six years ago, I guess, just around this time of year, it was around the beginning of November, we got together and we sat down in the Prince Hotel. It was obvious to me that they were not a very happy couple, and they weren't. And it was obvious why. They had never sat down and taken one of these gold cards and written on it what they wanted. They were locked in that particular... morning to a very negative polarity, I was locked into a very positive one. I was not about to move. And I said to them, John, what's something you really want? He thought I was being ridiculous, and he says, Pat and I would like to have our own house. I said, then go and get it. Well, he said, we can't. Well, I said, why not? Well, he said, we haven't got any money. I said, John, you don't need any money. Now, some of you would think that's sort of a ridiculous statement. They certainly did. They said, what do you mean we don't need any money? And I said, well, you haven't made a decision to buy the house. What do you need the money for? And you know, that's why most people never make a decision to live the way they want to live because they haven't got the money. Then the truth is they don't need the money until they make the decision to do whatever they're going to do. I said, you want to be in the house before Christmas? I took the calendar and right across the 18th of, De of December, I said, moving. Now, I said, you just think of how to get that house, not why you can't. I said, I'd be a poor guy to talk to from this point on because I don't have a real spectacular record in the area of real estate. But I said, I know a lady that does. She worked at Harvey Callis Real Estate just up around the corner from the Prince Hotel in Toronto. Her name is Natalie Kaufman, Natalie Wasserman now. I was just at Natalie's wedding last week. I said, Natalie, I got a couple of live ones over here for you. <laughs> they want to buy a house and they haven't got any money. And I remember her saying, oh, great. <laughs> but at any rate, she came around, and I said, Natalie, John and Pat have an image in here of the kind of house they want. I want you to listen carefully to them until you get the image in your mind of the kind of house they want. Go out and find it and come back and tell them how much they need to put down on that house. And I said, it'll probably turn out to be an awful lot less than what they thought. They thought it cost lots of money. They didn't know how much lots it was. The very day that I had marked on their calendar, the 18th of December, they moved in to number 7 Bards Walkway in Willowdale, Ontario. They lived in that house for a couple of years, and they sold it for a handsome profit. And the lady that bought the house is here today. Stand up for a minute, Vera. Vera Kozel bought that house. Is that correct, Vera? Yes. Thank you, Vera. Vera lived in it for some time, and she sold it for a respectable profit. Now, I'm only going back five, six years. The lady that bought it lived in it for a while, and on the 15th of September, my own son and his wife bought it. That's right. Is that right, Leslie? Brian, stand up there. Am I right around? Now, how old are you, Leslie? 23, Brian? 26. 26. I keep forgetting. All right. <laughs> Reminds me how old I am. Here he is, 26 years old. Where did I say I was when I was 26? I didn't even know the war was over. <laughs> I didn't. But I never had very good information running around my head. You see, that's not the first house they bought. That's the second house they bought. They've got the first one rented. And now they're living in the second one. And yet they're only 26 and 23. You telling me you can't make it? Here's a kid here from Burlington, Canada. The Barry Banner Advance. A little town just north of Toronto. City. Not a little town at all. Overcome procrastination. Earn a million. Earning a million before the age of 30 is passe. 
Tim Krochuk told Barry North Collegiate students how to earn it before they're 20. All you need is a winning attitude and the ability to overcome procrastination and intimidation. A 19-year-old student from Burlington, Ontario, it's a combination which has earned him a net worth of $1.5 million. An audible gasp uh, escaped from the audience of more than 75 students at North when Krochuk revealed what he was worth. He said, there's no trick to having a winning attitude. It's all in the way you think. He said, this stuff, although it sounds really hokey, it works. This kid had his first business when he was 12 years old in grade 7. He's had eight cents, four of which is still in operation. You think you can? That kid started when he was 12. Brian and Leslie just bought their second house, 26 and 23. I was trying to figure out where to get the rent. And I'm going to tell you, on more than one occasion, I never got it, so they put a lock on the door. I'm not going to ask you how many of you that's happened to, but it's happened to me, and it happened more than once. Didn't even know how to do that. I met someone that really understands money, and I married her. <laughs> and when we came back to Toronto, I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to originate an idea, and we're going to start a company so that the people that go through the seminars will be able to have a choice of going and getting competent financial advice. And you know that thousands of people have gone through that company. Now, Linda operated that company. The first couple that went through there were getting married in nine months. I'm going back about eight years. One said they couldn't save money, and the other one said they couldn't save their soul. <laughs> Nino, you know this couple. With a proper plan, they had enough money to put a down payment on a house and buy all the appliances for that house nine months later when they got married. Here just recently, they sold that house, earned a handsome profit. In fact, they earned more money, profit on that house than they have earned themselves working since they started to work and they moved into a much more beautiful house. Now, if you're not making a headway you want, for goodness sake, go get some advice. Now, you go back on page 19. And as you take a look in this book, again, if you're sitting in your family room or you're sitting out in the back porch, on page 19, write in a date that you're going to have an appointment with a competent financial planner. And go and sit down and let them help you answer the second question. The figure below is the amount of money I need to provide the things I want to live the way I choose to live. Don't let your present financial situation deter you from going right after the thing that you really want, your goal. I want to introduce you now to a couple that I've just referred to in the seminar who thought they couldn't go after what they wanted because it would cost lots of money. But with the proper advice, they got exactly what they were after. They're a couple of very dear friends of mine, Pat and John Swan. We met Bob early that day. I remember it very distinctly. It was at the Prince Hotel in Toronto. Uh, we were to meet him at 7 o'clock in the morning. And the whole purpose of the meeting was to find out what we really wanted. We didn't know at that point, but we knew we wanted something. And I remember meeting him, and he looked directly at John and said, what is it you sincerely want? What do you want more than anything? And John just looked at him and... And I sat there and I thought, we'd been discussing this for a couple of hours. I sat there and I thought for a couple of minutes and I said, Bob, I really want Pat and I and Tony to have our own house for Christmas, 1982. And this was early November, and uh, I was, that's what I wanted, uh, and it scared me. Uh, we hadn't done real well financially up until that point. Uh, we were living in a basement apartment, and uh, the idea of owning our own home before Christmas was what I really wanted. But I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what I needed to do it. 
I didn't know where I was going to get the money. Uh, I had never bought a house before. I didn't know even who I had to contact as far as a lawyer or a real estate person or anybody that I needed to help me get this house. Not only that, John, we didn't even know how much money we needed. We didn't have a clue. We just thought it was an astronomical and we sort of discounted it, put it out of our minds. And that's when Bob sat there and uh, looked at us and he said, well, what you have to do is put together a plan. And with that, he uh, reached down and he moved his coffee cup off the placemat and he <laughs> picked up this placemat. I still have it. I'm not a collector, but I still have it because it... You've got to look at this. It's great. Right. It says the Prince Hotel down there. And uh, Bob turned it over and he wrote us out a recipe of what we needed to do to get this house. And he wrote a statement on top of the uh, placemat and uh, it says decide on, on the amount you want to live the way you want to live and uh, go for it. And with that we started into some action. Uh, Bob suggested uh, a real estate agent uh, that we contact and, and get this real estate agent to show us some houses, find out what the prices were, find out what kind of house we wanted. The, we had to get a picture, a clear picture of what we wanted. We had to get emotionally involved in that picture. Uh, it was something that was, a, it was such a big idea for us at that time. Uh, it scared us. It really made us uncomfortable. And with that, Bob, Bob laughed. You know, he really did. He said, it should make you feel uncomfortable. If it's a big enough goal, it will make you feel uncomfortable. And he grabbed my day timer that I had sitting on, on the table, and he opened it up until uh, December 20th. And he, you can see the day timer. He put a line through the day, December 20th, 1982, and, and he wrote, moving into house. And that made me feel uncomfortable. After that, we... Uh, closed the day timer and he said, well, I have a real estate agent that you can call. I know of a, a girl that's attending the seminar that's a very good agent. So he told me to uh, call her. And I said, okay, Bob, when we get home, I will give her a call. He said, no, call uh -huh. her now. <laughs> There's a quarter, go. <laughs> so I went to the phone and I called her and made an appointment with the real estate agent. And uh, later that afternoon, we went and looked at some homes. Within a couple of days, we found exactly the home we wanted. And uh, then the pressure really came on because we signed an offer on this house. The offer was accepted, and we still did not have the money to close the house deal. It was, it was interesting. It was a lot of emotion. Uh, it was a fair amount of pressure because it was uncomfortable. And when you're doing something different than you've normally done in your past, it becomes uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable to you. But to uh, make the story come to a beautiful ending, November, uh, early November,